Okay, so thank you all for being here today. Um, this is a, a unique experience. This is usually done live and with everybody, but um, things happen in life. And so I want to uh, really congratulate the students in particular. They've really uh, worked through this quite seamlessly. Um, of course, we want to thank our staff with uh, Megan and Ellie and Christy and everyone who's been involved. But uh, I think most importantly, um, are our providers. You know, our providers play really the key role in this program of doing research for um, outside internship providers. And um, for those of you who may not know, I'm Professor Auerbach. I work with the students uh, along with the staff to help uh, assist in uh, having the students, you know, conduct their research and put their presentations together. But honestly, it takes an entire team of people to get to where we're at today. So um, I certainly want to start off by thanking our providers, though. Um, you know, this program is running. Something fun else later, okay? This program is running Bye. for uh, about 10 years now. And um, we've worked with a lot of different providers. We do recognize it takes a lot of time and effort uh, on their part to participate in this. Um, but we're really excited. So on behalf of the center and the Unruh Institute, we just want to thank uh, Alyssa and all of the Nature Conservancy people, as well as Jessica Dutton, who has been uh, with us now for, I think, about a year or so, and she's been also supporting uh, this group. So thank you to uh, uh, both of them. They've been a, a big help. So with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the students. Um, just by way of process, so everyone knows, we do have the students present out without comment from any of our panelists. At the end of the presentation, we would then open up to Q&A. For those of you that are panelists uh, here today, our providers and, and, and the others, you certainly can uh, voice your questions. If you are not a panelist, you certainly have the opportunity to um, chat a question and then Megan will um, offer up any of those questions that are put through our chat uh, process. So. With just no further ado, yes. Really quickly, sorry. Um, for anyone who is um, is wants to ask a question but doesn't um, isn't considered a panelist and is an attendee, there's two functions on your um, bar below. One is chat and one is Q and A. We'd ask that you use the Q and A function and not the chat function. Um, and I'll be monitoring them when the time comes. So again, Q and A, not chat. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Good luck and uh, looking. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn it over to, uh, to, the, to the team. Uh, you can go ahead and start the presentation. Okay, thank you. So hello and thank you again for coming to our, pre our presentation on Approaching Managed Retreat in Long Beach with a focus on communication and policy strategies. Um, before we begin, we would like to thank again our, our providers and Nature Conservancy and their partnership with the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. This has been a great experience and we're excited to share our findings with you. My name is Amaya Simpson and I will pre be presenting Managed Retreat and its importance and also the legal structure surrounding the topic of Managed Retreat. Our research question that guided our findings is, with sea levels posing fatal and economic risk to coastline properties and infrastructures, what are the best communication and policy recommendations to enact and confront Managed Retreat while recognizing current federal and state regulations, structures, and grant programs. In order to answer this question, we first had to answer the question of what is managed retreat? One of the best and simple definitions that I felt summarized the large topic of managed retreat is the purposeful coordinated movement of people and assets out of harm's way. This is extremely important because retreat will still occur managed or unmanaged. Real estate worth 1.4 trillion is already located within 700 feet of the U.S. coast and sea level rises alone projected to affect 4 to 13 million Americans. Even low sea level rise projections and existing development will require managed retreat at a much larger scale and on a faster timeline that has yet to been achieved. 
Also, unmanaged retreat practices, such as accommodation or resistance, can lead to abandoned homes, erosion, create extra costs and missed opportunities in areas such as disaster relief, displacement of communities, and gentrification, and other environmental justice injustice issues. I will touch on this a bit later in the presentation. Ministry trade is not only important for financial reasons and property, but current models of accommodation and resistance practices, such as seawalls, riprap, raising homes, and beach nourishment can cause shoreline erosion and a detriment to various important ecosystems. This can also lead to people's lack of access to the coastline and provide a false sense of security and resistance and accommodation measures. For a brief introduction to legal structures pertaining to managed retreat practices and protocols, there are two main legal structures to consider when attempting to implement managed retreat practices. These are federal and state or local governments. The Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972 is an act that creates powers pertaining to the coast of the United States. The goal of this act was to preserve, protect, and develop, and where possible, to restore or enhance the resources of the nation's coastal zone. This act and the NOAA administers its powers through national programs such as the National Coastal Zone Manager Program, the National Estuarian Research Reserve System, and the Coastal and Estuarian Land Conservation Program. This federal act is a combined powers act with state and local governments through collecting and analyzing data, preparing management programs, and implementing such programs. Although this act does not mention managed retreat protocol specifically, through the NOAA, it's in states and local gov agencies or governments may apply for certain powers, but this is on a state by state basis. Most managed retreat practices that occur federally will be through buyouts, relocation, or adaption programs through, through FEMA. This is an important piece of the puzzle pertaining managed retreat, and it's in action, and I will talk about it later in the presentation. P specifically, through the state of California, there is the California Coastal Act of 1974 and the California Coastal Commission through an enforcement program. Each of these programs allow for quasi-legislative and, and, and judicial practices, but none in particular to manage retreat. These, uh, the California Coastal Enforcement Program specifically would only work through um, unmanaged retreat practices as sea level rise and the shore gets closer to homes and they will have the power to tell these homeowners that they have to move or get further permits. And now to repetitive funding. Over the year, FEMA has created many programs in order to reduce the amount of repetitive funding and insurance claims. This is extremely important due to the amount of debt FEMA and the NFIP has accrued over the last couple of years. The current program now is a hazard mitigation program. As you can see in the graph, in the light orange, this is the most that has been um, funded to many homeowners and taxpayers. The Hazard Mitigation Grant Program is a FEMA program developed to reduce or eliminate long-term disasters and flooding. This grant was also developed with two other flood mitigation assistance and pre-disaster mitigation grants as seen on the current FEMA grant programs. The Hazard Mitigation Grant Programs pays up to 75% of the funds for mitigation projects such as acquisition, uh, elevation, hazard mitigation plans, structural retrofitting, and many more. As you can tell, these are not managed retreat practices, but rather adoption and mitigation practices, which in turn does not eliminate repetitive funding. But in order to be eligible for these programs, one must conform with approved state and local mitigation plans, benefit the disaster area, solve a problem and be technically feasible, and many other um, designated areas that you must fulfill. But in order to receive funding for the pre-disaster mitigation grant programs, which are more in line with managed retreat and relocation of homeowners before these disasters and sea level rise occur. But in order to receive, sorry, in order to receive these fundings, you have to go through a myriad of different steps. Then FEMA has to make funding decisions based on the agent's priorities uh, for the most effective use of grant funds and availability of funds posted in a notice of funds opportunity announcement or grants.gov. This um, opens up environmental justice issues, which I will talk about in the next slide. The PDM program is a highly competitive grant program. And this is the same for the uh, flood mitigation assistance grant program. So the next topic I wanted to touch on is environmental justice. 
For federally managed buyouts, uh, richer and more populated areas are more likely to implement voluntary buyouts. This may be due to their access to more funds, so they're able to have these funds to move and be aware of the situation. They also may be able to access more grants from FEMA because they have more power to talk to the state and local agencies, as you can see in the graph and the triangle, the uh, inverted triangle, and see all the steps that they have to go through, which poor or less densely populated areas may not be able to know. But in state or county managed buyouts, poor or less densely populated areas with uh, relatively lower education levels do not know the entire system and they are in the hands of the state completely. Um, in this case, they are more likely to be moved out involuntarily um, through the state and this can create issues such as gentrification or less diverse neighborhoods, um, which is a huge problem that I wanted to touch on. And this is why communication strategies that are concise, um, in particular to these poor or less to populated areas are extremely important, which leads to the next part of the presentation. Okay, hi, my name is Madison and I'll be presenting on communication strategies. You can go to the next slide. After a deep dive into best practices of climate change communication, we've synthesized our findings into three core pillars that can be adapted for the purposes of a unique communication strategy for the city of Long Beach. The idea behind having a clear and unique communication strategy is that all actors advocating for climate resilience within the community sign onto the same strategy. This will produce a cohesive vision that will streamline the work of government, nonprofit, and other community groups within Long Beach and allow for clear communication with the general public. The first pillar of our strategy is inclusive. Conversations surrounding climate resiliency incorporate both those directly affected by managed retreat and the community of Long Beach as a whole. While it's not always feasible or even desirable to get all interest parties and stakeholders into the same room at the same time, it's imperative that the whole community feel like they're playing an active role in the process of climate resiliency rather than a passive role. The Aquarium of the Pacific has already hosted climate resilience workshops and plans on continuing and expanding them in the future to include specific groups such as faith groups, ethnic community groups, and health professionals. While we haven't had the opportunity to attend past workshops, we have compiled workshop specific best practices that will be included in the research paper that may be considered by the aquarium and its partners for future workshops. The other tenant central to inclusivity is identifying a single communicator, which we propose is the Aquarium of the Pacific. While the aquarium is already playing an active role as advocate for Long Beach's climate action and adaptation plan, there are currently various sources of information within the community where information and different information is available. We worry that the potency of the information on climate resilience and managed retreat may be lost when sources of news are competing and diluted. We recommend that the aquarium become the one-stop shop for the city's plan for climate resilience, thus priming the public in a positive way for grappling with the issue of managed retreat. When the aquarium becomes synonymous with Long Beach's plan for climate resilience, this shifts the association of these charged topics from government to community. Within the comprehensive pillar, there are three distinct points. First, transparency. All risks, vulnerabilities, and implications of proposed solutions are communicated transparently with the general public. This mentality must trickle down within government and necessitates a buy-in from all officials who plan to engage the community about climate resilience and managed retreat. The capacity for public officials to embrace this approach and commit to consistency is critical and we propose a workshop specifically for city employees on best practices for public engagement, which will be detailed in the research paper. It's crucial that all residents feel as though they are valued partners who have access to all information, eliminating any inherent hierarchy posed by the government versus citizen dynamic. The second piece is framing. We propose that Long Beach's climate action and adaptation strategy be rebranded into a project that envisions the long-term success and development of Long Beach, a plan for the city's future. We believe that expanding the definition of resilience far beyond climate resilience is key to understanding the growing needs of a community experiencing affordable, hou experiencing affordable housing, mental health, and environmental crises, among others. 
rather than associating managed retreat with the inevitable defensive posture that must be assumed by the city, Long Beach can reimagine the entire city rather than solely the areas at risk. A positive vision for the future can outweigh present loss and pairing retreat with development approaches will speak to the resilience of a community investing in a city for the future. Ideally, innovation and new ways of living with water emerge without affecting the local economy in the medium or long run, while the other challenges the city faces are addressed simultaneously. And third, as touched on before, the aquarium would become the comprehensive hub of information, the vehicle through which the city of Long Beach would communicate with its residents. This would require both a redesign of the website to feature both interactive sea level rise tools and relevant science to educate residents, in addition to publicly promoting that these resources exist. This will be expanded further in, a, in later, later in the presentation. The third pillar is a sustained approach, which means that not only are short, medium, and long-term solutions explored, but they are pursued simultaneously. The objective is that the timelines are both inclusive and exhaustive. In the short term, emphasis will be placed on the support groups hosted by the aquarium, which will become a platform where emotional and social processing is built into the community engagement process. It is imperative that the locations change and the times vary to accommodate as many people in the community as possible. While Long Beach has conducted a survey on climate change, we suggest a survey specifically on sea level rise in order to procure enriched data specific to the community, which will help inform public engagement techniques and hone in on the specific concerns of residents overall, rather than those solely of the most vocal. While we're aware that resilience officers already exist, we propose the position be tailored to the three pillars communication strategy. Long Beach resilience officers would serve as the glue between all the working parts, communicating between all those responsible for implementation and ensuring cohesiveness among all actors. The UCCSU Environmental and Climate Change Literacy Project has released a comprehensive report as to how to integrate environmental and climate change literacy into compulsory K-12 education. Adopting these plans in the short term throughout the Long Beach Unified School District is the key to educating the next generation of decision makers. In the medium term, the city has the opportunity to lead by example. Relocating key infrastructure projects and revising the rules of development by folding in incentives to recede from the coast will be imperative to setting the scene for managed retreat, all of which should be promoted and communicated to the public. While managed retreat is listed under Long Beach's climate action and adaptation strategy as long term, this communication strategy offers the opportunity to engage with aspects of managed retreat far before 2050. Here are a few samples of infographics that can be used to achieve resilience in Long Beach. The first details the three pillars of communication strategy, which is all the way on the left, and can be used internally among organizations. The second specifically deals with managed retreat and is intended for public engagement. And the third provides an overview of the Long Beach resilience strategy, preparing the public for what's to come. All right, so we identified a couple community partners for this project, the first of which is the aquarium because it is family friendly, it is nonpartisan, and it attracts tourists. Through the aquarium, a number of initiatives will be carried out by the California State University of Long Beach, the Surfrider Foundation, and Long Beach Libraries. The aquarium should be a platform for better communication. It would help with virtual reality and libraries, and it would help organize discussions with Surfrider and Cal State Long Beach. So there's a lot of research, next slide please. There's a lot of research about managed retreat, but very little is accessible and very little is about Long Beach in particular. Juliano Khalil has worked on the Sea Level Rise Explorer and he's working on one for Long Beach. This will show communities um, through virtual reality what their neighborhoods will look like in 10, 20, 50 years. There's research that shows that virtual reality makes situations more immediate. People see sea level rise as it happens in their communities and they can decide to do something about it. Virtual reality can also be very low cost. The Google Cardboard costs about $20. With a mobile device, you're looking at about $100 per device. 
and the pilot is already paid for. There are 12 libraries in Long Beach, and the uh, pilot will be a good indicator of whether this project works or not. The aquarium's role will be to translate what is already into English and Spanish um, into Cambodian, Tagalog, and Chinese to serve different communities in Long Beach. They would also design a display that would be around the virtual reality so that children younger than 13 could still learn about managed retreat in their libraries. There should also be a space for collaboration. Research shows that when people are allowed to communicate about what they learn, they internalize it and they further want to share it. Next slide. But virtual reality does not take the place of lectures, so the aquarium will also be the face of retreat. This means that all published materials from the aquarium would be, uh, would, on managed retreat would have the aquarium logo, and the aquarium would organize discussions with Surfrider in Cal State Long Beach. Surfrider is a good partner because they care about the ocean, they're very educated about it, and they want to keep beaches for the people. What we envision for Surfrider is that they will be given a task similar to ours to come up with strategies for communicating, and they will also lead Urban Tides walks. These are walks sponsored by the USDC grant office, and the idea is that citizen scientists will go out, they'll discuss managed retreat, and they'll take a picture at the highest point of the tide to see where the sea level rise is already affecting their community. So these pictures can then be used for efforts from sea grants. At Cal State Long Beach, we envision an internship unpaid during the school year with the understanding that this would lead to a paid internship over the summer. Student responsibilities would be anything from organizing social media campaigns for all partners to use, to organizing the grant urban tides walk, to organizing lecture series and interacting with clubs on campus communicating to the clubs that are active and seeing where they can integrate managed retreat into their activities. The aquarium should also serve as a research commons. The aquarium Twitter and the Instagram should be a one-stop shop for citizens to get their questions answered about managed retreat. They should also organize their website a little bit better. They've done a very great job at organizing the lecture series, but these events start to come up with error messages from 2011 and before. And it would be better to organize these lectures by topic as well as date so that they can be used by people who are interested in learning about, about managed retreat in their communities. We also suggest a competition that the aquarium hosts annually for members who, researchers and students who use lecture material in their research. This would keep the archives active and not just a dead resource on their site. Next slide, please. The idea is that managed retreat will be tacked on to existing initiatives. It needs to be from the ground up and it needs to be um, everywhere. The idea is that the resilient Long Beach tabling booth, which educates community members um, from the aquarium, it would be at art events. It would be at the Art Walk at Long Beach. It would be at the Chalk Festival, Movie Nights in the Park, relevant events at California State Long Beach, like their October um, Sustainability Month. It would be at nature events, like the Shark Lagoon Nights and the Climate Fest at Long Beach, relevant city calendar events, and sporting events, like the Long Beach Marathon, 5Ks, and the Grand Prix. The idea is that if managed retreat is everywhere, citizens can start coming up with new creative solutions to educating and combating this problem. All right, so now that you've heard our communication strategies, we'll now turn to policy proposals. My name is John. I will explain our shorter term policy proposals and Matt next will explain our longer term proposals. Uh, the first of these policies involves taking more advantage of the aquarium's website and informational resources. Next slide, please, Maya. As Kat and Madison discussed, we believe that the aquarium will be an effective messenger to the community about managed retreat. As a first step, we recommend making the aquarium's online resources more easily accessible because the aquarium is in such a great position to become a central information hub. 
This might involve, for example, adding a tab on the front page of the aquarium's website that links to resources on managed retreat. One thing we found that could be updated, for example, is an online interactive exhibit that maps flood risk along the Long Beach coast. That map is similar to the one shown here, which comes from the Long Beach Climate Resiliency Assessment Report. This interactive, however, opens with a pop-up message that reads, this page can't load Google Maps correctly, with text covering the screen that reads for development purposes only. If an interactive map like this were less buggy and more accessible, it would be a great tool for people to visually understand flood risk for themselves so they could look for their own houses on it. As Kat mentioned, the aquarium's resources also include videos of its lectures and events, and also substantial information on sea level rise, but the information is scattered. So again, simple organization could help bring everything together and make it more accessible to the public, as would a Twitter answering questions in real time so people feel that they're listened to. Next slide, please. Our second short-term policy involves a three-step restoration process. The first step is to protect and maintain wetlands. Currently, most of Long Beach's wetlands have been developed and much of this wetland area is now ports. We cannot simply remove a port to maintain a wetland, but Los Fritos and the aquarium have put boundaries for what needs protection. As seen in the picture, the light blue areas were once wetlands, dark blue areas show current wetlands. Los Cerritos and the aquarium have identified 66 acres of wetlands to be protected. In cleaning and maintaining these wetlands, the aquarium and Los Cerritos have planned community days and volunteer programs, often gathering hundreds of volunteers. Therefore, Step one of the restoration process would involve working with the aquarium to further keep these wetlands safe. Initiatives like this also have an added benefit of community involvement, which brings awareness to the issue. The second step is to plant about 100 naturalized coast trees. Palm trees such as the Mexican fan palm, Canary Island date palm, and queen palm are naturalized coast trees and native to Long Beach. A variety of these adult trees will greatly soak more water and help mitigate rising sea levels. In addition to planting palm trees, the city should also thin trees by cutting branches to maximize the number of trees that can be planted. However, this proposal can be relatively expensive because the shipping and planting of an adult palm tree can cost an average of $15,000. The third step to restoration is to remove unnecessary seawalls and restore natural barriers. Long Beach cannot simply remove all seawalls because that would destroy much of the ports. Currently, there are little more than 2,100 linear square feet of seawalls and the city is expected to spend an additional $100 million by 2040 to raise these seawalls. However, as people retreat inland, then some seawalls that are protecting coastal properties will no longer be necessary. And instead of raising these seawalls that aren't protecting coastline properties, the city can actually save some money for other policies such as buyouts. As coastal communities move inland, therefore, the city should gradually remove these unnecessary seawalls and restore the natural barriers. But nonetheless, to be clear, Long Beach's core identity still lies in ports, and the policy proposal does not intend to remove seawalls in a way that would alter the ports. Likewise, uh, we do not plan to remove seawalls protecting ports because that would result in huge economic losses. Long Beach should still be a port city without their economic activity being prohibited by managed retreat policies. Next slide, please. And on to local zoning changes. Currently, through low premium flood insurance, the government essentially subsidizes people to live close to the water. Many of these people even have a false sense of security as standard NFIP insurance is fairly limited. It does not, for example, cover flood damage caused by earthquakes, even though that's undeniably important in California. The city should require homeowners to purchase more full flood insurance. In addition to being a hedge against future risk, Requiring this purchase will increase economic incentives to protect oneself from flooding. Protective measures can reduce insurance payments as can moving further away from the coast. Large scale engineering projects to prevent sea level rise become an incredibly costly repetitive expense. And like low cost flood insurance, they create a false sense of security thereby encouraging building closer and closer to the coastline. Therefore, the city of Long Beach will ultimately have to enact managed retreat through rolling easements or allowing the sea to migrate towards land. Recognizing the impending danger Long Beach faces from rising sea levels, the city could enact laws that prevent new development in at-risk areas and laws that prohibit landowners from building to fight erosion or sea level rise. In essence, the city has to enact laws that recognize the public interest in allowing the coastline to migrate in. That said, it's not feasible to move families out of their homes right away. 
Instead, it makes much more sense to allow families to remain in their homes, but to buy out the home and not allow new families to move in once the original family passes on. An effective strategy might be setting up leaseback agreements with residents so that property would be committed to manage retreat, but residents would not have to move out. This could be done either by a government body or by an organization such as the Nature Conservancy. Now to rolling easements. The idea behind rolling easements comes from the public trust doctrine, which is the idea that the state holds the title to land under public waters. This tradition is especially strong in California, where the California Coastal Act mandates public beaches begin at the wet sand line, which is the mean high tide line. If Long Beach enacts a policy that prevents homeowners from blocking erosion or sea level rise, then through rolling easements, the city can devote the land under rising waters to manage retreat. Uh, I'm Matt, and I'll go over the long-term policy proposals. The first policy involves tax incentives at a federal and state level. Given the high successes of having tax exemptions for installing solar panels or buying an electric vehicle, tax incentives with the purpose of fighting climate change are generally highly favorable. Therefore, at a federal level, since 39% of the nation's population, population live in coastline counties, mm -hmm. we propose that there be incentive um, for individuals who accumulate profit from selling their coastline property. Um, these proposals would not include statutes on capital gains. On the left of the table is the year for which a person sells their property, and on the right explains the tax exemption for the individual or household. So for example, in 2021, if an individual's taxable income bracket was 300000 after they sold their coastal housing property, then the individual would traditionally have to pay a tax rate of 35%. Um, but under this act, the individual would, own, um, would take a 25% tax exemption and now pay 26.25%. In addition, California should also enact um, property tax exemptions for individuals who move inland. Um, a state statute that includes a two-year property tax exemption for current coastline individuals who move inland between 2020 and 2025, and a one-year exemption for individuals that move inland between 2025 and 2030. With these two policies, the state and federal governments can really encourage manager treat. Um, but although no states have tried to pass these tax incentives, some coastline counties in Florida and Virginia have failed in passing similar initiatives, mainly because there would be billions of dollars lost in revenue. But we recommend that policymakers show the economic consequences from rising sea levels, whether it is the economic destructions of refurbishing damaged properties or renovating seawalls. Lawmakers must show that these costs are greater than the amount of money lost in revenue from tax incentives. But given the high polarization in Congress today, perhaps such tax initiatives cannot be passed and it is best for states that have more at risk flooding communities to partner with the federal government. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Although expensive, the second long-term policy proposal involves TNC buyouts. Um, the illustration on the right comes from an EPA report on rolling easements. It shows that through cluster development, manager tree efforts can be effective even if not every home along the coastline retreats. In the image, homes are corralled to make room for easements. The report proposes that clustering homes, as shown on the top row, is preferable to more spread out zoning for the same number of homes. Um, in other words, a smaller section of the shoreline needs to be protected if homes are clustered. Um, we can learn from this that a bio program can be effective even if not um, even if it is only concentrated in certain areas. This solution will not forever be enough to establish rolling easements, but it is in the right direction and cheaper than a retreat along the entire coastline. Essentially, which suggests that the Nature Conservancy aid manage um, retreat efforts by offering to buy out the properties in pockets with the greatest near-term flood risk. Long Beach's climate resiliency port, which John mentioned earlier, already details exactly which geographic pockets are at the highest risk. Um, targeted buyouts, while so expensive, would be the best way to help the community. Homeowners who receive fair market value for their land would have resources to relocate instead of being trapped by their investment in their home. This is especially useful to the homeowners because as flood danger increases, the value of their property will decrease. These buyouts would also benefit the community because we understand that easements through undeveloping land protect a coastside community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
The third policy, uh, the third long-term policy proposal involves federal buyouts. The first option involves the federal, state, um, or city um, negotiating a price with individuals who are willing to sell their house, which is usually equivalent to the fair market value. Um, but with individuals who are unwilling to sell their coastline property, the government can invoke the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment, which gives the federal government the right to obtain private property for public use as long as landowners receive just compensation. Um, and upon the Supreme Court case, Keel v. New London, um, the federal government must emphasize that it is in the best interest of the public for the government to acquire volatile coastline properties because rising sea levels pose grave economic and fatal risks to the communities and homeowners. Um, but this proposal involves numerous legal hurdles. Um, hence, the second proposal involves FEMA fund about, and essentially a FEMA fund about would give homeowners who are willing to negotiate their property between 2020 and 2025, um, the fair market value of their property plus 10% of the original home's value. A five-year timeline is crucial so that FEMA can stress the importance of manager treat. But in terms of cost, this proposal can, can be quite expensive because it is estimated to cost $4 trillion and FEMA's budget is um, $18 billion. Therefore, it's highly impossible to enact for an entire area, but perhaps FEMA can, buy, um, can help with ballots of centralized areas, as mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And lastly, we'll finish our presentation by concluding with our recommendations. Um, we have broken our proposals into communication and policy strategies. As for communication recommendations, we believe that the picture on the right is a good representation of what we envision for the aquarium. When talking about manager treat, the aquarium should be the um, anchor and central factor. Primarily, we recommend that the aquarium becomes the face of climate activism in Long Beach and the vehicle through which manager treat um, is advocated. Manager trees associated with the aquarium and not local governments or politicians. Secondly, all infographics must be consistent and distributed at all events in order to begin community um, exposure to manager tree in a quick, low pressure um, context. Third and fourthly, the Nature Conservancy and the aquarium must co sponsor support groups hosted um, by the aquarium two to three times a year um, and invite all community groups within Long Beach, especially government partnerships. Um, fifthly, while Long Beach has surveyed the community on climate change, we recommend um, a sea level rise specific survey to cater to the thoughts, opinions, and specific needs of Long Beach residents. And lastly, we recommend that Long Beach create um, the role of resilience officers, which are to work with partners and make sure that communication is smooth. Next slide, please. Um, as for policy recommendations, we, bro we broke it down by Long Beach, the state, the federal government, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, for Long Beach, we recommend that the city funds the aquarium with more money. In the 2011-12 budget, the aquarium received $121.67 million, um, but it only receives <clears throat> $9.24 million. Um, it has lost more than 90% of its budget funds. Um, likewise, Long Beach should also add an environmental section to the budget and enact environmental friendly tax initiatives by creating a carbon gallon limit on boats um, to increase the budget for this new section. By increasing the budget for the aquarium and adding an environmental section, we believe that the aquarium will be more prepared to be the central anchor in our communication strategies. As for California, the state has led initiatives um, and continues to be a global voice in the fight against climate change. Let's continue to lead climate change um, initiatives and enact tax incentives through property tax exemptions. Additionally, the state should buy out coastline properties and undevelop these lands to parks to show the effects of rising sea levels, which can be a future source of revenue. Thirdly, the federal government should enact st tax incentives to encourage manager treat. Um, and lastly, the Nature Conservancy should have buyouts along clusters of groups to provide re resources to the greatest number of members. The Nature Conservancy um, should also lobby for FEMA to reduce the hazard mitigation grant program because this program consists of mostly mitigation and adaptation policies that could cause shore erosion and further detriment to important ecosystems. And the Nature Conservancy should communicate pre-disaster mitigation grant programs to assist with lower income communities and ensure that they're not left behind or gentrified. These are our communication and policy recommendations, but we would like to make one last comment. As Long Beach moves inland, um, they will experience economic losses because the city is heavily dependent on coastlines. 
ultimately, Long Beach will have to balance long-term um, safety and environmental considerations with more immediate economic issues. But nonetheless, managed retreat is still the most ideal policy to enact because it is an opportunity to plan for the inedible future uh, and inedible events of rising sea levels, while there's still time to gradually, rather than abruptly, shift the economy. Thank you again, Jessica and Alyssa, for your tremendous work and for, for providing us with empirical data to create strategies on approaching manager retreat. Yay, team, very good, good job. You probably can't hear it, but everyone's cheering for you. I think you all did a great job. Um, why don't we unshare those slides for a second and um, we'll go ahead and give uh, Alyssa as well as Jessica an opportunity to um, ask some questions. But uh, this is really just a time for you all. Now that you can all take a deep breath for a second, we know the presentation's over and I thought you all did a really good job. Um, to just start to tease out some of these issues a little bit more detail, uh, we'll certainly start with, with our um, two partners, but then uh, Megan, to the extent that we get some questions through the Q&A, uh, we'll have you go ahead and, um, and ask those questions to the team. So Alyssa, if you can maybe direct um, whatever questions you have to um, either the whole team or certain members of the team, and then we'll go from there. Okay, hey, wow, everybody, that was so great. It's so fun to see um, kind of the progression of some of the ideas you had when we first met and then um, a, you know, a month or so ago when we had uh, that last meeting. Uh, you guys did such an amazing job, and it was it was so tight and concise. And then I, I really applaud you for really really great work. Um, I took a ton of notes, and I'm really excited to see your guys' final uh, report and be able to look at some of those amazing graphics you created. Uh, those are really great. Um, I did uh, have a couple questions that I'd love to uh, run by you. Uh, have you expand a little bit on some of the things that just piqued my interest? And um, and uh, some other things that uh, uh, what you presented um, made me think about. Uh, first, Amaya, you did such an excellent job of kind of setting the framework and um, and uh, you know giving kind of the overview and and some of the legal structures. So really great job. Thank you. Um, my question to you was yeah. My question to you is um, whether this issue of kind of the term around managed retreat popped up for you as you were doing your research and. Um, have you guys, do you guys have any thoughts both, and maybe this also goes to uh, Madison uh, um, ab about um, communication. Um, should we be rethinking the, the terms that we use? And um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Um, for me, when uh, researching legal perspectives and poly perspectives, I think for a managed retreat, I either found two terms. It was either specifically managed retreat or unmanaged retreat practices or other adaption, mitigation, resistance. Um, I think those are good terms to use. Those are what really concentrated my research. Um, but maybe for the general public, there could be another term. I don't know if this applies to communication as well. Catherine. Sorry, can you repeat your question? But I can jump in real quick, Kat. Um, so crazy. I would say that um, managed retreat is an appropriate term, and I think that the public should be familiar with it. However, I think, and we touched upon this a little bit in the presentation, just kind of going out there and talking about managed retreat without it being in a broader context, that's when it gets a little bit difficult, I would say, in everything that I've researched. So I think the terms are appropriate, but the broader context in which they appear should be taken into consideration. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, my next question is, um, I really liked this idea when you, in the communication section um, from Madison and Catherine, when you're talking about kind of shifting the narrative and the communicator from this perception of government um, to community. And I'd love to hear you kind of think a little bit more about, um, uh, talk a little bit more about what that was. And I'm also curious if you, you thought about it in relationship to the, the Coastal Commission. I didn't hear a whole lot of, um, in the presentation about the role that the Coastal Commission plays on 
talking about managed retreat. And so I, I think that's actually a really relevant um, recommendation for them as well is how to shift from this perceived, you know, that the perception of managed retreat and who's talking about it from government to community. Yeah, so um, you might be familiar, but I, I did some research. I, I try to look at basically all cities and counties resilient strategies throughout the country and kind of find which ones would be the best models for Long Beach. And one of the kind of like top contenders that I found was the uh, Miami Beach 305 strategy, which you might be familiar with because the Nature Conservancy works. Um, they're one of the partners for that strategy. But what was really unique um, and innovative about that strategy is they almost created like a new organization. So it's called like Miami Resilience Team, something to that effect. And it's a multi-city and county partnership with community partners as well. So intergovernmental is what they call it. Um, and what's really cool about that is that the city nor any of the individual organizations is the spokesperson. If any of them are speaking about these issues, about their strategy, it's through this kind of new umbrella organization. So to me, that seemed extremely effective because it, it kind of, um, it kind of curbed that, that um, hierarchy that we discussed. Um, and it became this new, this new organization altogether that no one had any preconceived notions about. So that was really effective. And I think to kind of redesign, it would be a whole overhaul of Long Beach's climate you know, action adaptation strategy, which says, it says what it's about in the title already. But if, if you were to overhaul that um, in this vein, I think that would be extremely effective. And to add on to that, the, policy, the communication methods that I described, I was focusing on low to cost solutions. So um, by outsourcing a lot of the initiatives, the Aquarium and the Nature Conservancy and even the Coastal Commission should be more likely to accept these um, shorter term policy uh, and communication recommendations. Okay, thank you. I also really liked this idea of having a CSU Long Beach student um, and uh, internship and um, on sort of an ongoing basis. I think that's a really great recommendation. I'm assuming you meant that as part of um, a, a, the aquarium and their work, correct? All right. Right. So the idea is that they would be similar to the resilience officers. Um, they would they would have the most clear idea as to what's going on on campus and they could integrate different initiatives, different aquarium initiatives um, into the different clubs. Okay, cool. I, I also um, liked this piece about a space for collaboration um, and I wrote down that you guys had a um, citation there. I'm, I'm curious what, if you wanna go in a little bit more detail about what that would look like in the example perhaps that would explain. The space for collaboration for virtual reality or the support group? Um, I think it was that, you know, that the, I think maybe at the library or something that you'd have both the kind of VR, but a way to then that it wasn't just a standalone thing. And, and yeah. yeah, so I'm not sure. So you, you tell me what the difference between the two. So what I meant by that is so first of all, it can't just be a VR um, set because children younger than 13, um, you don't know how it expects their brain. So there should be pages, there should be um, like flyers that people can take and learn about managed retreat. But the libraries also host a healthy schedule of events. There should be time for community members, um, much like the discussion groups, to talk about sea level rise. Um, perhaps people would, um, like story time, they would watch Sea Level Rise Explore, and then they would talk about it and see how they can um, support Managed Retreat or how they can change the perceptions about Managed Retreat um, in their community and how they can share that with others. That's what I meant. All right, Jessica, I don't want to, I want you to be able to jump in too. I have like a couple more questions, but I can also let you have a chance. 
Oh, no, Alyssa, I, I think I've dominated. Um, I've gotten a chance to okay. work the class pretty much the entire semester. And so more than questions, I mostly just wanted to say well done. It's been a real pleasure to watch this evolve as you guys have really taken on the project and um, dug in. So I'm going to let Alyssa um, get her fill of engagement with you. Okay. I also know that a couple, well, um, my colleagues from TNC are also uh, putting some questions on the, on the um, Q&A. Um, yes. And I hope, I hope you guys, if you guys can hear me, you guys keep doing that. Um, I had one other recommendation and one more question. And uh, this is for, let's see, this is, this is for um, Matt and John. Um, uh, I really like the way that you went through your policy recommendations. One um, piece, when you're talking about the clustering uh, for potential buyouts from TNC, the one thing I might add is, you know, you, you said emphasizing places with the most risk, but I would extend that to sort of the intersection between risk and opportunities for, um, for nature. Uh, and so where, you know, obviously where the nature conservancy and that um, kind of our bread and butter and, and um, being able to look at opportunities to restore habitats that could be really valuable from both um, a biodiversity perspective as well as um, as well as for people and uh, ecosystem services and so I would um, extend that a little bit um, and we love we're like all about doing spatial uh, analyses and so looking for where those opportunities are um, my final question was just about the, um, and this is maybe for the whole team, um, but certainly uh, Matt and John is the, um, the how to fund. I mean, all of this, these great ideas um, were really um, inspiring and, um, and, if, and even all of the uh, outreach, that, that does cost quite a bit of money. And so I really liked this idea uh, that you started to talk to, I think it was Matt, talk, talking about um, whether or not there was some sort of local tax initiative, um, whether, you know, the city uh, and, and kind of if you want to expand a little bit on that, um, because I think the biggest challenge and, and you nailed it about the aquarium and, and that any of these other organizations, right, will be how to, how to fund this. Yeah, so I think um, like if we look like at other cities that are trying to pass like Manager Tree or just other similar initiatives, um, like a lot of it comes with like how to fund this and some cities they even pass like soda taxes um, or even just like taxes on like s smaller daily use things. Um, but um, I think one of the big things we could do is because Long Beach is like a city um, port um, that we can really emphasize like a boat um, carbon tax. So like one thing I mentioned um, was just how like um, it could be like, a 19 flat um, carbon ton uh, per hour rate um, because so so pretty much like if a boat is traveling like 10 miles uh, or sorry 10 hours away um, then that boat's destination um, to Long Beach should not exceed 190 like a uh, carbon ton um, otherwise then then the boat can get charged and we could determine that based on the fuel that they're using so try to use more like uh, to try to use fuel that is more environmental Alyssa, we can't hear we you. We can't hear you. For some reason. I'm on mute. <laughs> um, oh, I said the other thing was um, also looking at opportunities, because uh, there's a lot of oil and gas industry in Long Beach. It's obviously really part of its history, right, and why it's, why it's so developed here. Um, and so there might be some opportunities in sort of the tax um, initiative there, too. And then the other thing I wanted to point out on your last slide, you had um, reduced the hazard mitigation grant program. And I, I'm not exactly sure what you meant by that. I think maybe, because uh, I actually think there could be some really great funding sources from that program. And so maybe instead about reducing it, it's about reforming it and, and having it actually um, help with some of the stuff you're talking about. But I, 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 I also don't want to put words in your mouth, so I just, that jumped out at me. Um, I can answer that question. Um, 
the reason why I was um, thinking about reducing the hazard mitigation grant program is because when looking into where they allocate their funds, it's mostly on retrofitting or uh, raising the homes. So I didn't think that really was uh, focused on managed retreat policies as much as the pre-disaster mitigation grant program. I feel like if we increase the pre pre-disaster mitigation grant program funding instead of the huge um, amount of the hazard in the, uh, the hazard mitigation grant program, it would um, should be more focused on managed retreat instead of um, retrofitting. Okay, and then when you look at the pot of funding, I think that HMGP and Sarah can also jump in here too if, um, if she's on, but um, I think that has a bigger pot of money. And so I think maybe changing that to reform um, to not have the focus be you know, um, flood protect, you know, um, flood proofing and stuff like that, uh, that, that having these more long term things be really integral. Um, but I, that's a really good point. Definitely. Okay, that are those are the questions I flagged. So I'm hoping others have other others and I'll jump in if there's anything else I can think of. Great. Thank you. Megan, are, do we have any uh, questions on the Q&A? Yeah. Yes, Kelsey um, said, do you believe these policy recommendations could be applicable to other cities in California and possibly beyond? Of course, there's local context that plays in, but would love to hear your thoughts on this. Does anyone want to dive in? Who, who, want, who might want to grab a hold of that one? Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I think that these policy recommendations um, can uh, be used in other places than California um, or even other cities. Um, because, um, I mean, there are other cities that have tried to pass manager tree, um, but whether it's like the funding that they're going to, or the losses from revenue, um, or even just um, changing uh, like their economic uh, focus, um, or even just communication, um, like it's not, they don't, it's not really clear so i think that if like um a place like long beach um if they were to lead like the um such uh policies or even other cities then we can start seeing um other locations enact similar policies adding on to that mm. oh, i can't hello adding on to that i would like to mention um communication policies are pretty universal um that slide that had the barricading uh certain communities along the coast as opposed to the entire coast is really useful. Um, it works for different areas depending on the economic standing. So San Francisco is actually at risk of sea level rise as well as you're aware. But by communicating with the community, they were able to raise an unprecedented. Uh, so by having focus groups and asking them, what do you want your community to look like? They were able to get an 85% approval for increased taxes to preserve the pier um, tourism area and to kind of adapt a manager treat right with the water um, treatment plant. Choose where is important to choose. Great, good, good, great suggestions. Um, I had a question. I don't know if this makes any sense at all. And the thing that came uh, across to me when I was sort of hearing these recommendations, was I was hearing a lot about taxation which people are not gonna like. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about people losing their homes, which people are not gonna like. I wonder, and, and maybe this is just not realistic, but I, you mentioned sort of the oil and gas angle, or at least that they're, you know, there's certainly a prominent role down in the Long Beach area. I mean, when I think of Long Beach, you know, you think of oil and gas, you think of long shorelines and sort of entertainment. Um, and restaurant communities, things of that nature. I'm wondering is rather than solely going on the angle of sort of tax, 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 which, you know, in light of how enormous this number might be to actually move thousands of homes uh, away from this area, I wonder is there, is there any way to, uh, to, to earn some sort of income, almost like I'm thinking like wind farms or just, you know, allow the oil and gas industry into a certain area. I'm not about promoting drilling and whatnot, but that is a resource there that you know might be able to be tapped. Is that something that's that's being considered at all, or or worthy of consideration, or is it simply that the communities ultimately and the government are going to have to bear the burden of this cost? I don't know if anyone wants to to touch on that or not. 
Seems pretty quiet out there. Alyssa, do you have any thoughts on that or is that just something that's not, uh, doesn't fall within the realm of realistic? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really tough. I think there could be opportunities um, offshore. Uh, I, I would not want to see more oil and gas. I mean, right, I, 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 look, I'm not promoting that either, about, but I'm yeah. trying to make lemonade out of lemons. You know, I mean, you've got to, you've got to find yeah, I mean, income talk, somewhere. Yeah, you guys talked about the, the Los Cerritos wetlands, which is, a, I don't know if you have dug in much to, to that project, but a very controversial issue because, um, you know, the, the oil and gas industry um, what had sort of um, long, you know, without an end in sight in terms of how much drilling they could do in those wetlands. And um, basically the, the local government um, and the Coastal Commission bartered with them to allow them to do more drilling in a smaller footprint to allow other areas to then um, be available for restoration, mm -hmm. um, which is really, was, you know, for um, a lot of uh, kind of conservation environmental organizations like ours, really a hard one to stomach because here you're allowing a lot more oil to come out of the ground because you're allowing them to um, do a lot more slant drilling, but yet you can open up a lot of base of really degraded wetlands, right? So I don't know, it's a really tough one. I, I know there's been also some talk about the offshore islands um, in Long Beach and whether or not there might be opportunities um, based on those. So they're gonna, you know, those are oil platforms as well and they're gonna go underwater. Um, and, you know, we had this group from um, the Art Center College of Design who did a project uh, similar to, to your guys's uh, from a design perspective, and they said, what if we did, um, you know, had, uh, had, like you said, uh, renewable out there, what if we had um, salt water um, desalinization mm -hmm. systems out there, you know, are there other opportunities to, to create, um, uh, to create income as well as, um, as well as more uh, sustainable practices uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's really tough. Um, I don't have a, a magic answer, but I do think this funding question is one of the biggest ones. Um, you know, you guys didn't talk too much about maybe the state's opportunity to um, have some funding sources that would go to these types of buyouts or leasebacks or, you know, whatever that it was, and there may be a role for the state to play um, to encourage um, kind of innovation in this space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the funding problem is huge. You know, the FEMA's, um, particularly the National Flood Insurance Program is not doing well financially and how that can be, how FEMA is the long-term strategy and buyouts just seems unrealistic. Yeah. Um, so really, really difficult question. Well, they'll be hard, quite, they'll be hard, hard decisions <laughs> to make. I'm glad I don't have to be the one to make them, but I, I think exploring the whole concept of manager retreat is certainly, is certainly something that needs to be done. And um, I think you all are leading uh, the charge in that regard and doing a great job. And hopefully the presentation and what, we, uh, what you heard today, as well as what you'll receive from our students from their papers will be useful. Um, again, we wanna thank both you and Jessica. It, um, you know, this program simply doesn't work without the providers. And uh, we think that the level of engagement that you provided our students was really valuable this, this semester and also putting up with our, our new recent challenges. It seems like we really got through this uh, fairly unscathed. So we really appreciate all your involvement. Thank you to the entire team. I think you all did an excellent job. And uh, just keep in mind some housekeeping issues uh, that your final papers are due to me by Monday at 12 noon, uploaded on Blackboard. Uh, make sure you have your political events uploaded, your workshop uh, write-ups over to Ellie, and we will we'll go from there. I know we're up against the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and call it a day. And thank you all again. Yeah, can, I say, can I say one more quick thing? I know that the Certainly. aquarium, uh, Jerry Schiffel wrote me a note to say he was so sorry he couldn't be here. Um, but I do want to figure out the best way to share with him both some of your guys' information um, from your final papers and maybe even share this recording. I don't know how you feel about that, but... Um, I, I'm sure he would be really appreciative to see some of this too. Some yeah, really well, great you, will, uh, you'll, you will certainly get um, all of their papers. Uh, I'll get them to you next week when we sort of start corralling everything and get our grading done. But well, I, I don't see any reason why 
uh, you wouldn't have access to this recording. Megan, is there? Yeah, that's correct. So um, the reason we did it in the webinar format is that we're going to kind of polish it um, a little bit and we're going to add um, logos and all that stuff. So um, that being said, you will absolutely have access and um, we will send it to you just as soon as um, we can. Excellent. Good job, everybody. Yay, good job. Congratulations. so great. Okay, very good. And then then before that, anybody leaves. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you, Christy. You knew I'd forget. Thank you. Art. Yes. Great job, everyone. And Alyssa, to your end and to Megan's end. We're going to make it beautiful. We're going to put on our website and all the information you will need will be on one um, website page. So we'll be sure to send that to you soon. But for that page, we need some great photos. So it'll be really great is if everyone can throw up a fight on and I can take a screenshot of this. Great. Keep it up for about 30 seconds. I'm going to take a couple different screenshots. Thank you. Thanks so much, team. Looks great. Okay, all. Great job. Thank you. And uh, get those papers in. Take mm -hmm. care, Alyssa. Thank right. you. Thank you, Jessica.